good afternoon i am very happy to welcome you all to today's lecture what's in a diet as many of you may know icts in association with jawaharlal nehru planetarium has been conducting popular lecture series coffee with curiosity since over 4 years these lectures by senior scientists are for general public uh, and are aimed at encouraging curiosity of public in science however since march 2020 activities all over the world were affected by covid pandemic here at planetarium we had completely closed all our in person activities since mid november when things eased out a bit we opened our sky theater shows for public though with lot of restrictions we have arranged for non contact type of uh, transactions at all places including our science park where one can get explanation about models using augmented reality app during this time jnp has produced several videos on various topics topics range from information on night sky watching titled sky this week to syllabus based video lectures on science topics our academic staff have given given several online lectures on the request of different educational institutions we have planned several online and in person activities for limited number of participants in coming days in fact in a few days from now we have a four days long telescope assembly workshop where participants can build their own telescopes we are planning many more such activities both online and in person please visit our website for information on our activities we had our last in person lecture copy with curiosity in february 2020 later due to covid-19 activities everywhere were stopped thanks to the efforts of ics icts team these public lectures have continued on online platform we have with us today a very distinguished medical doctor dr anurag kurpat who is delivering a lecture what is in a diet i extend a very warm welcome to you sir i once again extend hearty welcome to all online audience i request professor p ajit to tell us about the new online program of icts cosmic zoom thank you all thank you thank you pramod uh, good afternoon everyone um, as as we just heard uh, you all of you know that uh, this series of lectures is is part of a very successful um, outreach program that Uh, ICTS as well as the planetarium has been uh, doing for the last several years um today's lecture is um, organized um also as part of a new outreach initiative that ICTS is um has started and uh, this is a, a a a virtual exhibition called the cosmic zoom and uh, this exhibition takes visitors uh, for a trip to the cosmos both the micro and the macro world and um, in this process we will also find um, surprising connections between the micro and and macro worlds as well uh, this this journey would be guided by two broad questions one is what are things made of and another is what is our place in the universe and our first question will take us to the world of cells molecules atoms and subatomic particles the second question will take us to the to the to the world of planets stars galaxies and and the universe itself and um, uh, as i said earlier uh, we will uh, find really surprising connections between um, the the extreme micro and the extreme macro phenomena so i i encourage you to uh, to uh, to to pay a visit to this uh, uh, exhibition which is the website is cosmic-zoom.in and after this lecture um as part of this uh, launching of this exhibition uh, we are organizing uh, several events in a um, in the next 3 weeks period and this is uh, part of uh, this is sort of the inaugural event of this this exhibition as well and uh, the events are listed in the uh, cosmic zoom webpage so cosmic zoom/events or 
the Facebook page of the of the Cosmic Zoom. So that is cosmiczoom.icts slash events. The link to register for uh, various events is is uh, is listed in these web pages as well as in the the Facebook page. Um, I'm very excited to announce uh, uh, the very first um, um, event after the inaugural event of the of the Cosmic Room, Cosmic Zoom, which is the uh, a lecture by um, a Professor Biman Nath from the Raman Research Institute, who is a, a renowned uh, astrophysicist as well as a, an author, who has written several uh, scientific as well as uh, uh, fictional uh, books um, uh, in the last several years. And this will be on the story of the discovery of helium, uh, which happened uh, a century and a half ago uh, in India, and how it uh, basically uh, paved way to the, to, to the, to the beginning of uh, modern astrophysics. So I encourage all of you to, to attend this lecture as well as uh, the other events uh, coming up uh, in the next uh, three weeks. So thank you very much. And I hope to see you uh, for uh, these um, events in the next three weeks as well. Thanks a lot, Ajit, for that introduction to Cosmic Zoom. Um, we are all looking forward to those events. So now it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Anura Kurpat. Professor Kulpat is a professor of physiology at St. John's Medical College. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, London, the National Academy of Medical Sciences, the International Union of Nutritional Sciences, and is a Mark Darshi Fellow of the Wellcome Trust DBT India Alliance. His interests are in human, uh, human energy, protein, and micronutrient metabolism. He is associate editor of the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition and co-editor of the Asia Pacific Journal of Clinical Nutrition. He chairs the scientific advisory group of the nutrition division of the ICMR and the ICMR expert committee on nutrient requirement of Indians. He is also a member of the National Technical Board of, the, of Nutrition of the Niti Aayog. It gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Kurpat, who is going to talk about a topic that is fascinating both from a scientific perspective and uh, is very interesting from a public policy perspective, which concerns all of us, which is nutrition. Uh, so over to you, Professor Kulpat. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Dr. Galgali, Dr. Parmeshwaran, Dr. Pandit, and of course, Anupam Ghosh, who have come to know quite well over the last two or three days. Thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm I'm honored to be part of your group. Uh, I was telling everyone that I was the outlier here and uh, I hope I've made, made it clear as to how little we, I will make it clear as to how little we know about, uh, uh, about what to eat. To be honest, I mean, you will be surprised as we go through to see the amount of guesswork that goes on when we talk about what's in a diet. So, uh, I'm going to talk to you first about generalities in this. And uh, essentially, the first question that everyone asks when, you, when they, uh, they ask me, what should I eat? Honestly, my, my question back to them is, what do you want from what you eat? And most people say, I want good health. And uh, when you go into asking someone what good health is, you get any number of answers. But let me tell you what the WHO has been saying since 1948 when it was uh, founded. And that is that health is a state of physical, mental, and social well-being. And importantly, health is not the absence of disease or infirmity. And many people actually see health as, uh, as an absence of disease or infirmity rather than the positive of good physical, mental, and social health. So really you can put it as well-being, but you know, people can also say very much that, well, if I eat a lot of chocolates, I feel mentally and socially in a state of well-being. So does that mean I'm healthy? Uh, well, in the long term, it certainly means you're not, but in the short term, you do feel good when you eat things that are potentially bad for you in the long term if you do too much of it. So health is a, is a difficult term and Let's move from patients or people to nutritionists specifically. And for them as well, well-being is a hard term. And if you ask nutritionists, 
what do you want to do when you when you prescribe a diet to somebody? Most of them will tell you, I just want them not to put on weight. I want them to be weight stable. Some of them may say, I even want them to lose some weight. Uh, some will say, I'd like them to be energetic. I'd like them to leap out of bed in the morning, full of beans. I'd like them to be strong at what they do. I'd like them to be alert. <clears throat> I, I want them to feel young. It's almost like some, some would want a fountain of youth to come from your nutrition. For the most part, therefore, uh, it's vague and many nutritionists may not have a clue as to what really they, are, they need to uh, go for when they give you a diet. If you ask them, give me a diet that makes me very functional, for example, on a hot Sunday afternoon, listening to someone going on and on about the diet, can you give me something that will keep me awake? They'll tell you, well, have a cup of coffee. And I'm, I hope all of you are having something to keep you awake as I drone on and on. But functionality is a very tough ask for nutritionists, for doctors, for people. And you can see where I'm getting now that diet and functionality are difficult. So what will a dietitian do? If you ask a dietitian, what should I eat? Dietitians boil it down not to function, they'll actually tell you, you should have X, Y, Z amount of nutrients, and they can make a whole alphabet soup for you out of nutrients. Or some of them will actually translate that into actual foods and tell you, you should have this, that, and the other foods. And of course, if you go onto Google, you'll get any number of suggestions as to what foods you should eat, when you should eat them, and how you should eat them. So, I think you're getting the idea. It's a mess, the whole business of what's in a diet. And if you ask the dietitian, look, I really came here to ask you that I wanted good function and I wanted the fountain of youth. And you're telling me about some quantities of foods to eat. How sure are you that I need these nutrients? How sure uh, are you about certain foods? And you know, you'll find out that what these nutrients, uh, nutri what the dietitians and the nu nutritionists and the doctors do is they become what we call reductionists. They try and reduce the problem to one nutrient at a time. And they'll figure out on a daily basis how much of that nutrient you use up in your body or you lose from your body. And then they figure out how to replace that loss that you, the, the amount of nutrient that you lost on a daily basis, and they'll correct that for a poor absorption or for when you heat the food, you, you lose those nutrients, so you need to add a bit more. So they'll kind of figure out these things, but eventually they are reductionist in their approach, meaning they look at one nutrient at a time. And secondly, they're kind of looking at it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and you might now already be beginning to think, well, I'm not too happy with that. Trust me, none of us are happy with that, but that's the way the entire world is working if you look at it. Um, so this reductionist approach, many people like to say, well, can we then just consider that our food is nothing but a set of chemicals and we just need to put these chemicals together in a test tube and then drink that and then we are done. Well, it's not because food as it is, is greater than the sum of its chemical constituents. So there's something more with interactions between these chemicals in a food matrix that makes those chemicals more relevant to your well-being. And the second about the daily business. I mean, you, some of you may be asking, well, you know, I do live life day to day. I do live life every morning, 6 a.m. I get up and then next day I see my beginning as another 6 a.m. But there are people in this world who live from week to week or from month to month. So the question is that in nutrition, we have kind of decided that we're gonna tell you what, you're going to, what you need to eat on a day-to-day -day basis and accept that. But of course, a, a very enlightened nutritionist may be able to translate that into what you should eat every week, which might make it easier for you to eat because then you have a choice and you might find you can vary your diet a little. So that's the basis. And let me tell you that learned bodies like the Indian Council of Medical Research, the WHO, the FAO, the United Nations University, 
the Institute of Medicine in the US, the European Union through its Food Safety Authority, they all follow this method. No one's cracked how we actually figure out the best way to eat to keep you at a high level of function. So we are quite unsure about what we should be eating. We have become reductionist and we treat it as a chemical that we need to take. But here's my point, and I'm gonna make you even more unsure. Here's the thing, that when your dietitian tells you, you need to eat, say 10 milligrams of iron per day, you must ask, surely 10 milligrams is not the same for everyone. We are all different people, aren't we? We are so different from one another. We call, we call that inter-individual variability. But not only that, we are all quite different from day to day. Heraclitus said, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it is not the same river, and he is not the same man. You are not the same person on a day-to-day -day basis. You are different. And perhaps, therefore, your requirements are also different. We call that intra-individual variability. And finally, it's also the food that you eat. There is you know, by crop, you'll find that if you had a good year, you'll have crops that actually have much more nutrients in them, If and different seasons have different nutrients. So things vary in the kind of food supply that you have, not just your demand, but also your supply. So just to show you how inter-individual variability is, this is a picture that I picked up about almost 17 years ago from a journal of nutrition in which there's a nice picture of elite athletes in the US. And you can see here that even if you, who perhaps don't know anything about nutrition, I'm not saying I do, let's say we all don't know enough, but even if we were asked, how do we prescribe food to these people? Are we gonna tell them all to eat the same amounts? It's very unlikely, not just because of the size. If you look at the person on the very right, uh, a sumo wrestler type person, well, you probably think that person needs a lot more food than anyone else. But more than that, you also have people who are thin and wiry. You have more tall people. So suddenly you begin to think the types of activities they're doing, some of them are pure strength activities. Some of them are endurance activities. Surely the food is different. And indeed it is. So there is a great deal of inter-individual variability and yet we all accept, I think quite blindly, that if a book or Google tells us this is how much you need to eat, we kind of think, well, we, we say, yeah, that's fine. If you think about it, if you go to your doctor and ask for an antibiotic or a painkiller, you'll probably be prescribed a tablet that's a fixed dose. It's very rare in medicine as well for drugs to be given uh, depending on the size of the person. A lot of cancer drugs and other more toxic drugs are given based on size, but for the most part, antibiotics are toxic as well. You will find that you eat about half a gram to a gram per day or per dose, and you get better. You may feel not very functional during that time, but you kind of accept it. So that's the first part. So we ain't no inbred mice for sure. The other thing is that, you know, you'll find that there's this, this intra-individual variability or even inter. If you, if you take a child that's very, very malnourished and starving, you'll find that child, even if you feed it a little, it will gain weight compared to the same little being given to a better nourished child. They use it less efficiently. So each of us has a different way in which our food is digested and utilized and then built into tissues. We call this the efficiency of utilization. And in general, let me tell you, we are very inefficient. In general, let me tell you that if you take protein, for example, if you were to eat one gram of protein per kilogram per day, or just one gram at a time, you'd probably stick only half that gram onto your body. The other half will be wasted and come out as nitrogen in the urine. So you think about it, that's a 50% utilization. A starving baby may have 100% utilization. 
So that varies. If you have an infection, the utilization goes even lower. It varies all over the place. So that's the second problem, inter-individual. Second one is intra-individual. And this is also the variability you can see within an individual. Did you know that your body weight, if you measure it over time, and this is data, sorry for this busy slide, but as, you, as one ages, your, the weight begins to also vary. And this is a, a, a group of, of individuals who are measured in, in, in the Northeast of the US. It's called the Framingham cohort. From 1948 onwards, they started following uh, 5,000 odd men and women in Framingham, Massachusetts. And they kept following them at least every two years for at least the next 16 years. So that's eight visits. And they found that in these men and women, the body weight did oscillate by six or 7%. Indeed, one thing they did find, which I'm not showing you here is, and, but you can read these papers if, you're, if, you're, if you want to, that you can actually link the variability of your body weight to the health that you have. And those who vary their body weight too much, say double this amount going up to about 12%, they actually have worse outcomes. So it's a good thing for you to think, how do I keep my body weight fairly normal, fairly stable, and don't go in for these fads where you suddenly think you want to lose weight and then you give up on the fad and then you put back that weight on. You are cycling your body weight and that's not a good thing for you. <clears throat> also remember this, which um, a lot of uh, dieting clinics will, they're all these, these fraudulent clinics that tell you we can guarantee you a weight loss. They are fraudulent because essentially what they're doing is getting you to pass water out of your body. Your body contains 60% water, <clears throat> which means for a 60 kg person, 36 liters of water are there, which is 36 kilograms. If you lose one liter because you are either made to sweat it out or whether you are given some diuretics which made you pass it out as urine, you can easily lose a kilo of body weight within an hour. That doesn't mean anything because you're gonna feel thirsty. And when you leave the clinic, you'll probably go and drink some water probably a whole kilo and you'll put it all back on. So this business of water changing your body weight is a problem. And typically for a 60 kilo person, you can change your weight by about one to two kgs per day, depending on how much water you were drinking through the day. So can you see now that just chasing a straight uh, constant body weight, you don't want to <clears throat> go above six to 7% variability in your body weight. Normally, it'll be 2 to 3%, and it, you can probably double it, but you don't want to triple it and quadruple it by doing crazy things with your diet. And to our own bodily variability, you have to, as I said, add the variability in the, in the supply of what we eat or seasonality in foods. I've gone into that. So the first lesson at the end of all this, if you can, if you can accept me saying I have a lesson for you, it is that our body our bodies and our nutrient needs are all very variable. They are terribly variable, yet you go to a dietitian and they'll tell you all of you should eat the same amount of food. It's so spectacularly wrong. How can we have faith in these numbers for what we should eat? Why aren't we just all falling over, getting sick because we're getting the wrong amount of food? So one thing is, I just want to tell you before I go further, is I want to tell you that what dietitians are doing and what all doctors do is they take an average. So what they do is they actually uh, measure, for example, these blue dots will tell you a bunch of healthy people, what their requirements are, and they'll plot a bell-shaped curve around that. And they'll say, well, let's take the average of that bell-shaped curve. And that's the average of many healthy people. And that's what you should eat. Now, I'm sure if you say, oh, okay, that's fine, then we willingly become victims of an average. We'll say, yes, doctor, thank you very much. It looks like you're giving me the middle of what many people require, just like you give me my aspirin dose, just like you give me my antibiotics. Thank you for the food that you give, that you suggest I eat. Fair enough. But is that a good thing? 
Now, I want to give you a story here about variability, and I want you to think what, I want you to have an opinion, obviously, on what I say. This actually I took from a book, which is called The End of Average. And it's written by Todd Rose about how we succeed in a world that values the sameness in people rather than their differences. So this is a story, there are many stories in this book, I urge you to read it, let me tell you one. So the first story is about how after uh, the Second World War uh, came the dawn of jet powered av aviation. During the war, they were all propeller planes and then came jet planes. And the United States Air Force planes were very fast at that time compared to the propeller driven planes. They were very difficult to fly. And pilots kept crashing. 17 pilots crashed in a single day. And that was alarming for the US Air Force, obviously. When we hear of a pilot crashing in a MiG somewhere in the desert of Rajasthan, we get very upset. But imagine 17 crashing in a single day. That was a big problem. And the Air Force thought about it and they turned their attention to the design of the cockpit. And the cockpit was based on a pre-war measurement of an average man 20 years earlier. And there they took an anthropologist measured what they thought was an average man they took the average of the size and shape of the seat, the average of the legs length so that how, how well they could reach the pedals, how, how much the height of the windshield should be, even the shape of the helmets, because maybe the head also varies. So they were using some pretty old data. And so they wondered, are the pilots now bigger? Was there a new average required? It was because nutrition was better, I suppose. So in 1950 at the Wright Air Force Base in Ohio, over 4,000 pilots were measured in 140 dimensions, including their thumb length and you know crazy measurements if you think about it. But 140 dimensions, you, you can only do this in the army, I think, where you can order someone to sit still while 140 measurements are made on your body. Nevertheless, they did this, a huge amount. It was done by a very uh, intelligent person called Lieutenant Gilbert Daniels, who's a physical anthropologist. And he, after thinking about things, figured that out of the 140 dimensions, he'd decide on the 10 most relevant dimensions for cockpit design. Remember, they were also designing uniforms, they were designing helmets, but he decided, let me focus on cockpit design. And he went for these measurements, and this is, a, this is an original picture of his, of his data. And you'll see that he looked at stature, chest circumference, sleeve length, crotch height, vertical trunk circumference, a lot of things. And he got all these measurements down as a mean value. Now here's the interesting things. From these measurements, he decided he would take, he would create an average pilot and he would make an average as someone whose measurements were within the middle third of the range of values. Did you see that I showed you earlier? There was a lot of values here. There's a, what we call a mean, and the standard deviation is the kind of spread of the values, all right? So his thing was, can we look at the middle third and say that seems reasonable as an average dimension? And so could we then design a cockpit seat properly? So the important thing was that Lieutenant Daniels compared his average pilot to every single pilot in those 4,000 odd pilots, he checked to see if when he took his average measurements, was there any pilot in the 4,000 who fitted the average value on all those 10 measurements? And I can see you all shaking your heads and saying stupid question. Well, maybe none, zero fitted their average measurements. So the, the message was that if you have designed a cockpit to fit the average pilot, You've actually designed it to fit no one. Next time you sit in your car and you reach under the seat and you move your seat forwards and backwards till you get the right position. Next time you sit in your car and you move, there's a little lever that allows you to change the height of the steering wheel. Next time you do all those things, think about this, that it's that that probably protects you from driving rashly and driving badly. So the same point can be made if you're 
designed a diet for the average person. You've designed it for no one. I'm not sure how many of you will agree with me here. But let's face it, that's the advice you're getting. You're getting an average diet. And this is where there's a new field of nutrition that's beginning. It's called precision nutrition, where we actually take the trouble to figure out how much food a person really needs to eat. It's a tough thing. It takes weeks to figure out for one person what they need to eat. But once we do it, it's better for them than just giving them an average value. Remember this, if you're taking an average, you're doing something that no one requires. So, you know, there's an, I just want to give you, you know, I'm sure all of you ask yourselves, am I an average weight? Have I got the right weight? Because I need to eat to either put on weight or lose weight. So you take your weight, but how do you know it's okay? So the one way to understand whether your weight is okay is look at your weight in relationship to your height. And you'll find that as you, as you take taller people, obviously a taller person weighs more than a shorter person. That's just size. So you need to find a weight index that's independent of the height, meaning it'll tell you whether you're overweight, whether you're tall or short. And that was done. Uh, so if you look at this relationship here, there's a bunch of individuals ordered by their height on the x-axis. You'll see that as you look at their weight, it goes up. Makes sense. Now, what do you want? You want something like an index that's independent of height. You want that line to become a flat line. So whether you're tall or short, that index tells you you are either overweight or not. And that is when you take the weight and you divide it by the height and again the height, or we call it weight per height squared. And that's what we call the body mass index. I'm sure you've heard of it. And that a value of 25 applies to everyone. If you're short, you're tall. If you're male, you're female, old or young, generally a value of 25 tells you that's enough. Don't go higher than that. Now, the fact is that this, this, this value came from a person, a Belgian mathematician and an astronomer called Ketele. And Ketele was fascinated by the body. Um, I hope the ICTS also would have admitted Ketele happily into their, into their faculty. Well, fact is he was interested in, in, in the body and he was trying to find the average man. And he said that all of us should have the same BMI. And if I find any variation, it's a, it's a bad measurement. That's ridiculous, right? If you find variation, it must be true. In fact, Darwin and Francis Galton at the same time, they accepted that if you take a population of people and measure them, you are going to find different people. And that is a variation that's normal. It's the reality. It's inheritable, in fact. In fact, that was Francis Galton's big deal. And whereas Ketele in Belgium was saying the opposite, whereas in the UK, they were saying something else. I actually come down quite heavily on the side of Darwin, obviously as a biologist, I should, I think. And uh, I would say that the requirement of nutrition average for me is just a number. What's really interesting is the distribution. And that's where precision nutrition comes in. Now, I just want to end this little segment by talking to you about, uh, you know, Francis Galton was a man who actually also was looking for average people, just like Ketele. And what he did was, um, well, I'll show you in a while what he did, but this is actually from a website where they were, a scientists blended thousands of faces of different ethnicities of women and men to find what the typical woman's face or the typical man's face looks in 41 countries around the globe. They use what they call a face averaging tool. And this is called composite portraiture. And this is what they found. And here the, at the bottom left are what they found a typical Indian looks like or a typical South Indian. I'm not sure if you agree with this or not. You needn't, of course, that you should because you might say, well, the thousand people they took, what biases were there in those selections? We don't know. But you know, it, uh, it became even interesting because at the time, um, I just wanted to tell you that this sort of approach was used by Sir Francis Galton in the, 
1880s. And uh, he, he was fascinated by trying to create an average man. Uh, and in fact, he and Darwin were cousins. They shared a, a common grandfather called Erasmus Darwin. And this has gone on further, by the way, for those of you who watch Hindi movies, that's the average face of a Bollywood actress. And if you think I'm being overly sexist only talking about actresses, they also gave a Bollywood actor. And you tell me, do you think this is something that you recognize? I don't know. I don't watch Bollywood movies, so I can't say much for this. But nevertheless, the point I'm making at the end of all this is we love averages. We just want to find that median. And we think that's a golden median and that we should all live by it. But I think we are all very, very variable people. And in that sense, I feel, especially in the way we eat and drink and the way we exercise and sleep, we are all different. We must find what's right for ourselves. And that precision, unfortunately, doesn't exist. So what's in a diet? Well, it's an average. So to get back to knowing what we need to eat, we just figure out what you need as a chemical. It's a reductionist approach. And that's based on how much you lose in a day. And in what people do we measure this? We go out and we get what we think are normal people who are in good health, good status, who come from clean environments. You can't take someone who's living in a slum because they may have intestinal parasites and that's gonna increase their requirements. So it's gotta be clean requirements with meaning middle class, so on and so forth. And those who haven't gone binging in the last few days, remember this, if you binge a lot and eat a lot in the previous day, over the next few days, you're gonna be excreting all that extra you ate. And then it'll look like, gosh, this person needs a lot of nutrients. No, it's not. He's just getting rid of that too much that he ate before. So you have to select your people very carefully. Okay, so I've been talking averages. I've been dissing the whole system and I'm saying, look, we're all wrong. Why are we not spectacularly wrong? Why aren't people falling over with low blood pressure or dying, whatever? Because we dietitians have it totally wrong. Well, we are getting it wrong, but there's an important part of us, which is called adaptation. We adapt to the diets that we eat. It's a final variable that confounds our attempts for uniformity in the sense that if you give the average, you might find that a person becomes that average in their requirements. And that's why when we measure nutrient requirements, we like to do separately in India, separately in the US, because it depends on the adaptation that has occurred there. But adaptation is yet another story. I want to tell you another, okay, this is all about stories. So this is about another story at, done in, of a study done in Calcutta at what is called the Ludlow Jute Mill. And there, a bunch of investigators went and measured the food intake of all the workers who had a wide range of physical activity. This was done by somebody called Jean Meyer, who was from Tufts University at the time, working with local investigators. And if you go to Tufts, their nutrition uh, department and building is named after Jean Meyer today. Now, what they did was they looked at a range of people, all right? Can you see this on the x-axis? You'll find that there were people with medium work, heavy work, and very heavy work. And the very heavy work were those who carried things, who were there working the furnace with coalmen, blacksmiths. There were others doing heavy work who were just lifting things and sorting them out. Medium work was drivers and weavers and so on. And then there were light work, of course, like clerks and very sedentary people like people who sat in a stall all day. You see them, right? If you go to a, chai, to a chai shop and you look at that little box on the street and you say, gosh, there's a person who's sitting in that all day. And when you, next time you go to that chai shop and you ask for a cup of tea, just think of that person. He's been sedentary, he or she has been sedentary all that time. Not a very good lifestyle. But what they found was that if you look at the intake of calories per day, it actually went up nicely. Those who worked very hard ate a lot more. They adapted to their work by eating more. And those who could not eat more could not do that work. So generally it went along a nice line where those who were working hard were eat. Now you think that those who were very sedentary, it would kind of keep going downwards, right? And those who were the stall holders who were the chai shop guys would probably be the worst off. No, it wasn't that case. 
what was, what happened was that this adaptation actually failed and they found that remarkably as people became sedentary they started eating more i think i would too you know if you fixed me in a little box and i had biscuits in front of me to sell i'd probably eat a lot of those biscuits just out of sheer boredom so adaptation while it exists for most of us we do adapt to the type of diets we're given sometimes it fails and it can have disastrous consequences because in these people their body weights were high and although john meyer did not follow them up i suspect if he did you might find that these people had heart attacks well ahead of their contemporaries who were eating the same amount but were much more active so we can't bank on adaptation all the time is just a story i want to tell you just to back to the average i want to tell you that if you were to plot these requirements you'll find that you have what's called the average we call that the estimated average requirement and then we have the edge the right hand extreme value at the 97.5th percentile so let's just say it's the right hand extreme that we call the recommended dietary allowance so what we like to do is that if you are feeding a population say you're going to a school and you want to feed them you typically tend to feed them the average value but say you're a nutritionist who wants to feed a very worried astrophysicist who thinks gosh i just don't want to have any chance that i'm eating less please give me the safe value so this many times dietitians will actually prescribe this high value of nutrient intake which is used for a person it's too much actually but it's a very safe value so we prescribe either the sorry we prescribe either the ear or the rda for you if it's a population you stick with the ear even if it's an individual you should stick with the ear but for the very worried individual you tend to give the rda the reason for that is that we can never know your requirement you just walk into my clinic and you say i want to know what to eat now if i want to know how much you need to eat i have to measure your losses and that will take weeks so in that single interaction we have i can only tell you look i don't know how much you need but i can tell you that if you take the average value of the requirement of normal people you're likely to be at 50% risk of having a deficient intake and if you want to have zero risk or very little risk or 2.5% risk let me give you the rda all i can work with is risk i now have become an insured life insurance agent i cannot tell you how much you need but i will work with risk for you and i will tell you how much to eat you accept it if you want less risk take the rda now the problem if you're not comfortable with all these things of risk remember this if we if you agree that a child is best fed by breast milk in the first 6 months and i hope you all agree to that please you must if you ever see a mother who is not breastfeeding in the first 6 months please tell her your child needs breast milk alone we call that exclusive breastfeeding nothing else and what we do find is that when you look at mothers you'll find some mothers produce more milk some mothers produce less yet all their babies are well nourished and that is by definition the who wants this to be known by everyone in the world now it's very clear here that if you look at the average requirement from breast milk some babies are at 50% risk some are not but 50% is acceptable risk that's my point from this breast milk example all i'm telling you is that if you are at 50% risk with regard to your nutrition you're okay we'll follow up we'll see if you're feeling excessively sleepy or you feel very weak by 6 o'clock in the evening we'll we'll kind of then do some precision around that but you always start with the average and if you over prescribe by giving the rda remember one thing there are consequences if you take too much energy you will become fat as simple as that because you store it and for those nutrients that are not stored you have to detoxify them remember nutrients are chemicals they can kill you if you take too much of it so giving too much of a particular nutrient may increase the demand for other nutrients that detoxify it and this is well known if you take extra protein for example that contains an amino acid like methionine you will have to detoxify it by another type of amino acid called glycine 
So you really create problems for yourself if you overdo on one food. And this is why I always tell people, don't do fad diets. Like I will eat only nuts or I will eat only eggs. I'll do only protein Atkins. No, these are fads. You need balance because you have to detoxify things as well. And here are examples. There's something called omega-3 fats, which are found in fish and they are now in capsules. If you take a lot of them, remember one thing, those fats are very susceptible to be oxidized. And if you take that, you better take a lot of fruits that contain vitamin C and have extra antioxidants. Otherwise, you're, just, you're, you're setting yourself up for other problems. You take too much calcium, well, calcium will block iron. You'll need more iron. Then you take more iron, you'll need extra other molecules that are required to stop iron from killing you. It just goes on and on. There are also, you take too much of one food, there are toxins that there may be in foods. I want to give you this another story of this young lady who is at Tufts University, who was one of my PhD students there. And she was actually, she's, she's quite a hero because she's working in the, in the Congo. And she found a lot of what we call kwashioko over there, which is very badly nourished children. And she found that those kids, their mothers were feeding them cassava, which is a type of root that has a lot of starch in it. The problem is that cassava contains cyanide and normally mothers would soak that cassava to get rid of the cyanide. But in conflict, because this Democratic Republic of Congo has got all sorts of civil wars going on, she found that when there was conflict, these mothers were displaced, they had low water resources, they couldn't soak the cassava well and cyanide intake went up in the children. And then the children had to detoxify that cyanide. Now you can detoxify cyanide. I know in your books, if you read Agatha Christie, you, you, you take cyanide, you die. Well, if you take very tiny amounts, it's bad for you. But if you have in some sulfur in your body, you can convert it to a sulfur cyanide complex. And then it comes out in the urine. But then you, you, get, rid, you get that sulfur from amino acids. And that means there's less amino acids for growth. And as a result, those kids are fighting off the cyanide and therefore getting very malnourished. Same thing happens when you eat too much of food. If there's one toxin in that food, you can use up a lot of resources going off that. And so we did some kind of linear programming to figure out what kind of diet would you have to eat? Say uh, uh, what we call a woman of reproductive age who has an energy requirement of this proteins, 14% fat, say 27%. What should she eat on a daily basis to meet her EAR, her average requirement? That's what she should eat. You can see it here. And what we found is that if you, if you actually wanted her to meet the RDA, which is that safe level, instead of eating a quarter kilo of green leafy vegetables, it became more, much more of other veggies, fruits, milk. So suddenly you find that she's eating a lot more. And this is a serious worry that if you start saying, meet your RDA because you want to be safe, you begin to eat too much food and that's not a good thing. So uh, what we had, I just want to tell you that that is for raw foods and we're doing this today in our clinic. We can actually tell people how much of raw foods they need to eat to meet the RDA. But what good are raw foods if you have someone who doesn't cook? So we actually are now creating a virtual dietitian working with some very good people uh, who do this uh, machine language and so on, which I know nothing about. And they are, we are working with a database of cooked foods, likes and dislikes of people, comparing it to needs and then habits of people. And then that virtual dietitian can actually work and be at the side of the person in an app and actually keep, keep working to, to, to modify the diet as, as time goes on. I just want to tell you about energy very briefly, all right? And this is gonna shock you. Now, the norm for eating energy, can you see this? An adult woman, if she's sitting still, needs about 1,660 calories per day, and a man needs 2,000. Now, please don't think that this, we are favoring men. Men just are heavier. So per kg, they require a bit more. But just keep 1,660 there, all right? Just keep that in mind. Now, uh, a very fine young lady called Rebecca, who works with me, uh, she actually went out in, and sent her people out into, into, uh, uh, into full service restaurants and fast food restaurants in Kuramangla, because we are there. And she was working with someone from Tufts, who was also doing the same thing, 
in full service restaurants and fast foods like McDonald's and so on in Boston. And what she found was that on average, if you went into a full service restaurant, that means you go in and ask for a thali or you ask for a full meal, like Chinese meal. On average, look at the amount of food in that. It was 1,400 calories. Remember what I told you earlier, 1,600 odd was a daily requirement. You can get most of it with one meal. And even if you go to a fast food, it's not far behind. It's 1,100. And look at the kilograms of food. I mean, think about this next time you load up your plate at a buffet. I mean, you're getting a kilo of food per meal. And that means if you do it thrice a day, that's three kilos of food. Your poor stomach, it's not very good. And here's what Rebecca did, and this is what I really is shocking. What she did was she actually got them to do a parcel service, meaning you go into the restaurant and say, can I have a parcel? Can you pack it all up? They obliged. And then she came and then she put it into a calorie meter and she exploded it and figured out how much heat it gave off. So you can figure out the total calories in that food. And here you'll see that if you were to eat a masala dosa with chutney, uh, potato palya and sambar, you know how much you're putting away? A thousand calories. That's more than half your daily requirements. So next time you go out and order a dosa, Maybe you should eat half of it, not the whole. Look at a whole meal, a rice meal, 1,400. A roti, what we call, so this is called a South Indian thali in India, in Bangalore. This is a so-called North Indian thali, even worse, 1,800 calories. There is nothing but obesity that awaits you if you ate these kind of meals. So presumably you don't finish these, you eat about a third of it. And I hope you do only eat a third and the rest you take as a doggy bag home. For those of you who love Chinese food, I want to tell you, just see this. There's something called chicken fried rice with Hunan chicken. That's a whopping 2000 calories. That's, that's craziness. So next time you order Chinese fried rice, maybe you should eat one spoonful and be happy with it. I'm not saying don't eat this food. I'm just saying eat less of it. I'd say a good way to start is to say, I'll eat about 100 to 200 grams of food per day. Don't eat too much. What happens with protein? Now, protein is something very strange happened. I'm only going to talk about energy and protein in this talk. Now, protein is made up of a bunch of chemicals called amino acids. And there are some amino acids that you cannot make in your body. So they're called essential amino acids. And some that you can actually make in your body. So they're called non-essential, meaning you don't need to eat them every day. So in our reductionist framework, we really worry only about the essential because that's what you have to eat on a daily basis. Now, the WHO and FAO decided how much you should eat. And up to 2007, the requirement was based on data that was gotten in, in the US by a scientist called William Rose, who did great work. And William Rose actually measured how much amino acid you lost in a day. But he did it badly. It was very inaccurate because he didn't have the tools at the time. And indeed, that was used by the WHO and FAO till actually in Bangalore, we were able to actually use isotope labels to measure this amino acid requirement. And that the reason we use a label is like what a cow herd would do when they put a, a bell on a single cow, they can actually figure out where the whole herd is by listening for that bell. So one tracer cow tells the cow herd where the entire cow is. The same thing is, happens with the body when we tag an amino acid with a tracer and give it, we can actually figure out where the entire mass of amino acids are in the body. We can figure out the loss very accurately. And when we did that, we were able to change the requirements of FAO and WHO in this book that came out based on Bangalore data actually, where the world now was told that earlier you only needed 84 milligrams per kilogram per day of essential amino acids. Well, now you require double that, more than double that. And that really set the cat among the pigeons because if you think about it, India was going down the green revolution path. In the green revolution, it was very much let's stop hunger. And it meant that we were growing a lot of wheat and rice. Both wheat and rice do not have enough protein of a quality. They have some, they have protein, 
but it's not a high quality protein for human need because the essential amino acid called lysine is missing, is, is less than that. That's the problem. So we now know in our policy, we should increase the amount of plant protein that we're growing, not just wheat and rice, which dominated agriculture. It dominates our whole food basket system. It dominates the, the way in which we give subsidies to our farmers. We need to change it to look at other forms of protein. And I just compiled many years, five years ago, what India was producing. And you'll see here, this is from 1950 all the way to 2015, that India, this blue line that I'm tracing here is cereals. You can see that because of the green revolution, India produced a lot of cereals. It's now producing vegetables. The one success story is milk. There's one crop actually in India, that's a spectacular success. We are almost the best in the world in growing this food crop. I'm sure some of you may know what this crop is, particularly the economists among you, if there are any. Well, this is actually sugarcane, which is a useless crop really for food. It's actually bad for you, but we're the best at it. And you have to ask yourself, you know, this actually look at it, the reason it's going up is also because our population growth is going up. One of the reasons why these do well is because sugarcane, for example, is a very high yield, but it, it comes under a cooperative system and a lot of politics around sugar mills. But that's why it's doing well. If you look at the Green Revolution, again, it was, it's not cooperatized, but the government cooperatized it by giving a lot of extension fertilizers, by, by procuring what they make. So it does actually do well. And the third one that goes up a lot are the milk cooperatives. Milk has really gone up through what was called Operation Flood, where milk procurement went up. You know what didn't go up and remains flat like it's dead? Are plant proteins like pulses. That is such a pity. In fact, I do feel that the new farm laws, and I, I, I'm sorry to be political here, but I do believe that farmers need the freedom to find ways to, to create co cooperatives that increase production while protecting themselves. Definitely, they have to protect themselves. But pulses, look at it, it's almost nothing. All right, there's also a problem with absorption. I want to tell you that if you eat dal, you won't absorb it very well, okay? It's very hard to measure absorption. We use stable isotopes to do that. And the FAO loves what we're doing. So they actually write about it. And here's what we do. And we go to- Here is uh, the kind of facility that was Hello? developed at the- Can you hear me? All right, so um, this is, uh, what we're doing at the University of Agricultural Sciences, we actually grow crops of dal and we label it, we actually water it with heavy water, deuterium water, and then the whole dal gets labeled with deuterium and then we feed it to people. We also have chickens and these are chickens that love what we, so this in the syringe is labeled amino acids that are being fed directly to the chickens so that they can actually produce it in their eggs. So we get labeled protein. And we also have a goat to whom we first grew cowpea and maize in UAS with deuterium and then took it across to this Institute of Animal Health on Adugodi and we actually, uh, our National Institute of Animal Health, where we maintained this goat and we fed it with that, collected the milk and we were able to get labeled milk. So we've actually done a lot with that. And here's the point that you digest only 60 to 70% of the dal protein you eat. So remember this, if you want to be a vegan who eats only dal, fantastic, good for you, but eat a little more because you're not digesting it fully. Pulses are good for you. Almost every culture and society in the world that eats a lot of pulses lives longer. Think about that. So doesn't matter if it's not digested, eat a little more. Milk and eggs, very good digestibility. And now we have actually managed to create a pulse paste, which actually gives you a 90% digestion. It's not 60 to 70. So you don't need to buy so much pulses. And we were thinking of putting that into the feeding programs in schools. One last thing while I finish, okay? I want to tell you that as the world is changing and climate is changing, it's changing for the worse. As the CO2 levels go up in this century, and there's an article that came out in Science, and there are other articles in Nature as well, the protein content of rice 
and other crops, except for millets. Can you see the red lines here? It just shows that in different species of rice, it can go down to almost 20% less than it was. That's a dreadful thing to think about. Same thing with iron, it goes down, zinc goes down. So we are not what we are. The inter-individual variability and all the other things I told you about, that's there. But now add climate variability and it becomes quite a scary prospect for public health. So as I'm gonna end now with two, a couple of sobering thoughts for you. First is of course, don't believe headlines about nutrition. You get these hyped up headlines, chocolate can help you lose weight, melons produce, prevent cancer, blah, blah, blah. It's all, you know, it's based on regression analysis, it's based on associations. So what people do is they're chasing good health and function. So they're actually looking at good health and they're putting intake of nutrients on the other axis. So they do these association studies, which are dicey, they're not robust, and they keep changing. So one time they'll tell you coffee is good for you. And then one year later, you'll see another study saying coffee is bad for you. That's the problem with nutrition. When it starts moving out of that reductionist frame and starts moving to the functionality frame, it's not got it right yet. It's still not great. So be careful. I just want to ask you, and this is something that really I loved reading this, Amartya Sen published an article in the BMJ in 2002, so almost 20 years ago, but to me, it was a very perceptive article. What he did was he plotted a very simply life expectancy in, a, in years for the United States, Kerala, Bihar, and all India. Now, what do you get from this? You get very clearly that Kerala is almost as good as the US in terms of health, probably diets, everything. And Bihar is the worst. India doesn't do much better, but where would you rather live? Bihar or India? Well, uh, Bihar or Kerala? I'd probably say Kerala. But then he did another thing. He looked at the, another thing, which was as people reported how many times in the year did they feel unwell and unhappy? In other words, how many times did they go to the doctor? And you'll find that in the US, they were going to the doctor, well, a huge amount of times, but in Bihar, they hardly went to the doctor. Whereas in Kerala, it was, they also were a bit, you know, worried about their health. So he actually wrote this, that with self-reports, by the way, these are both self-reports, we could conclude that the US is the least healthy by based on the graph on the right hand side, followed by Kerala and Bihar enjoys the highest level of health in this charmed internal comparison. What do you think? So clearly, if you're gonna chase function, you're gonna get stuck at one point into a bunch of people who you might say are far more accepting of the world. And they say, well, you know, if I have my tummy aches a bit, that's life. And you have the other person who just says, no, that's unacceptable. I want a new diet. I want probiotics. I want yogurt. I want this and that. Who's more unhealthy here? Hard to say. But this is the variability about what's in a diet. And here's my last slide. I just want to show that to you. I hope I can get there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just want to show you that I want to talk to you about children. All right. Now. I just want to tell you that if you look at the height, this is my second last slide. So um, I hope I have another minute or two. Um, if you look at child growth, you measure it by what you call a Z score or a Z score. And a, a score of zero really means the child is growing normally. A score below zero is not so good, but a score of minus two is terrible. And below minus two, minus three, minus four is horrible. So that's how we judge children. And I want to tell you about a magic intervention that was done on children. I want you to guess what happened. So here's a bunch of Indian children who were given an intervention. And these are stunted kids whose Z score was minus three. They were horribly badly off. Yet in two years of this magic intervention, they were almost normal. They had come to minus one. They were well on their way out of it. And you have to ask yourself, what could this magic intervention be? Here we are in India, we keep hearing 
that you know people are trying to give this and that and the other and the tablet and some forti fortified foods. Children aren't doing better. Every time we get it in the news, Indian children are not growing well. What's going on here? This is a magic intervention that was done and children did very well. Why on earth can't we do this? I hope, I wish I could see your faces because I'll tell you what this magic intervention was. It was these children were adopted. They were taken to Sweden, flown to Sweden in an adoption program. And then in Sweden, this paper came out following these children. There was no magical treatment given to them, no special diets. <clears throat> they were seen by doctors regularly, that's all. But they were given a great deal of love, a clean environment, a wholesome diet, and they just caught up. And you think about it, what's in a diet? Not a lot, you just need to get it right. And when you say get it right, be sensible. Start with the average, but then begin to tweak it depending on your functionality. And you'll see here that, remember I told you, children who are badly nourished will, will use food very efficiently. That's probably happening here. That's why these kids did so well, even though they were getting an average rat, they were just using it so well. So you've got to also think that way with your own diets. Think hard that there's so much variability in this. There needs to be precision. I can think of no one other than our clinic that does precision nutrition in Bangalore or in India, I think. There's a clinic in Israel that is doing precision nutrition with a virtual dietitian for keeping your blood glucose constant. They're very much focused on diabetes, but they have a virtual dietitian already. And that virtual dietitian makes, a, makes errors of about 20%, which is great because I, I think if I were to give you a diet, I'd probably make a 20% error for sure. So I think they've done well and we're gonna get there as well. But until then, all I can say, what's in a diet, just be sensible about it and watch what you're eating. Thank you very much. I'm done. Eat well. Eat everything in moderation. And I always say this to patients. Everything in moderation, including moderation. Have a good time once in a way. And look at yourself all the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kropath. So uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, I will quickly move to the questions. So uh, Dr. Kupat, uh, first question is from uh, Mekha Rai. She is asking for Indian females suffering from anemia, what should be the minimum requirement in their diet, uh, which will be cheap and healthy? Suffering from anemia. Okay, so can I tell you that actually, um, <clears throat> Mekha, I hope you're not anemic um, uh, because one of the problems is that in India, we say we are an anemic country but actually the majority is what we call a mild anemia. And now the cutoffs for that mild anemia, they were earlier 12 grams percent of hemoglobin in your blood. That might be reduced, I want to tell you that. So we might find less people are anemic. However, you've asked a question about the diet, which is cheap and healthy. I will tell you this, there is quite a lot of iron in the diet. Every 100 grams of cereal you eat contains three milligrams of iron. So if you eat about 200 to 300 grams of cereal per day, which most people do, you're going to get about six to nine milligrams of iron. And then if you add dal and you add green leafy vegetables, particularly drumstick leaves and others, you will find that there's a lot of iron in those as well. If you eat ragi, you'll get a lot of iron from there as well. Here's the problem. The problem is that iron is not absorbed. And the reason it's not absorbed, and here's where... I really want to tell you, it's not so much as diet as your habits. One, make sure that you take some fruit, particularly a guava or a papaya or some citrus fruits. If you can stand it, take a gooseberry. But these contain a lot of vitamin C. And vitamin C really sucks the iron from the diet into your body. I can't tell you how many times we find people eating enough iron it's just going into the stools and into the sewer. It's not being absorbed. It's because they don't take enough ascorbic acid or what we call vitamin C, which comes from fruits. The other very important thing in India, which I think is important, is don't drink tea or coffee, 
soon after your meal. Tea particularly contains a lot of a molecule called polyphenols and polyphenols love iron. So they'll stay in your gut and they'll grab that iron and they won't let it be absorbed. So you can take a tablet of iron and you take it with a cup of tea, you won't absorb it. It's that bad. So try not to take tea soon after a meal and many, many, many people take tea after their lunch, certainly. Take it midday, uh, mid meal, between two hours, three hours after your meal, that is okay. But the fruit is critical and make sure you take a lot of green leafy vegetables and I think you should be fine. I hope that's enough. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. So, Professor Ajit has a question. Professor Ajit, please go ahead. Yeah, I had actually three. Thank you for this wonderful talk. I had several questions. So one is that, uh, what is your take on food supplements? Is there any evidence that they actually work? Okay. For food supplements, for what? Can you tell me? Have, do you have anything in your mind? Food supplements for it is what? Vitamin tab tablets and iron and, and, and there are all kinds of things and like vitamin tablets and, ah, and okay okay so i'll tell you when you are deficient they are very much required they are useless in the healthy person so food all these supplements if someone is deficient and that is what you can measure either through clinical signs like you can show less hemoglobin or something like that or you can take a blood sample and measure the levels and see if it's low, then a vitamin supplement really works. You know the problem? A lot of these supplements are pushed as what are called superfoods. There's no superfood in this world, none at all. Yet even today for COVID, people are saying, eat this superfood, eat that. If you're well nourished, nothing can help you. If you're going to get COVID, you're going to get it. It's an infection. Live with it. The point is there's no special nutrition supplement that can help you if you're already in a good state. So that's what I would tell you, uh, Ajit. No good if you're, if you're doing well. Very good if you're deficient. There's precision required. Okay, thank you. I have actually questions. I, I can wait uh, for others to, uh, and come back later. Okay. Sure, sure. So I'll move on to uh, another question from a live stream viewer. Priya Vijayan is asking, dear professor, with so many diet plans coming up like paleo, keto, and so on, what should we be ideally eating? What are your thoughts on those diets? Thanks. Yeah, you know, um, to be honest, I, I, I'm a votary for the normal balanced diet, the paleo diet and the keto. I think these are food fads. I'm not sure they do very well. I, I mean, the keto diet has its use particularly when children with epilepsy and so on. But I'm not sure, I mean, so let me tell you, the keto diet works for some and doesn't work for others. So by all means, try it if you want, but be aware that you're putting your body to a fair amount of stress of dealing with a very peculiar diet, which is skewed in one direction. You can try it out and if it works, it works. But if you're feeling weak, if you feel horrible, and I've had people who were on Atkins and high protein, they actually told me the reason I lost weight was because I ate less because the diet was disgusting. They didn't like what they were eating, but they just stuck onto it because somebody told them it would help them lose weight. Now, that's not a good reason. You've got you to be happy eating your food. So I would just say, I, I just, just go with a normal diet. Here's just the one thing, eat less. There is no doubt among animal studies, at least among studies from Japan in centenarians, that if you eat less, you will live longer. You'll probably get up from the table a little lighter, feeling better. Yes, you will feel a little hungry, but if you can embrace that hunger, you'll probably do very well, whether it's paleo, balanced, keto, whatever you want. Thank I you. Hope that Thank you, Dr. Krupa. Yeah. Uh, Professor Pranav has a question. Professor Pranav, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah uh, Professor Kurpa, thanks very much for a wonderful talk. Uh, my question is related to the question that was just asked. So, you know, most of these diets that were mentioned are driven by, uh, usually driven by, you know, people's desire for weight loss and so on. Uh, but there are some other diets that are motivated by other things. For example, 
a lot of people are moving towards uh, plant-based diets for environmental reasons or for ethical reasons. Yes. And um, in recent years, there have been you know, several uh, dietic uh, associations and so on uh, saying that the vegan diet is safe for all life stages and, and for all types of people. So I was just wondering what your take on that specific diet is and whether uh, you know, plant-based diets, uh, when they say they are safe for all uh, stages of life and so on, are they going by an average sort of uh, methodology or a methodology that takes into account you know, all people of all different types? Thank you for that question. And thank you for that, noting the average issue. I think in general, people are going with the average. They're not going by looking at the variability. That requires too much precision and too much money, in fact, because you've got to really do very large experiments. Anyway, to come back to this, um, I do think that a plant-based diet can give you everything you need, honestly. The only thing it can't give you is vitamin B12. That, unfortunately, is only found in animal products. And it's, it was thought by some cynical doctors in the early days that we actually weren't seeing a lot of B12 deficiency in India. And people wondered, look, they're all vegetarians. Surely they should be having serious signs of, you know, you get pins and needles in your fingers and you get anemic. You're not seeing it. So many thought that maybe it's because we just drink uh, sewage contaminated water. And sewage contains a lot of B12, let me tell you, because there are bacteria that produce B12 in it. So it could be that. But I would say, no, no, let's just clean your water up. Okay, I'm not at all saying you should drink sewage. But B12, you will need some supplement. But other than B12, a plant diet will give you everything you need. All right, let me be very clear about this. Let me give you the other side of it. You are a very, uh, you are a very functional, intelligent person. Being a faculty at ICTS, you must be in the top 0.0001 percentile of brains in this country. Do you know how you got there? You got there because the early hominids, which roamed the plains, they actually encephalized. They became, their frontal lobes suddenly became very big and they encephalized and became homo sapiens. How on earth did these hominids who were about four feet, three feet, four feet tall, roaming the plains, extremely small, fearful, weak, they could not hunt big prey. They lived off foraging fruits and, animal, and plant foods. How did they encephalize? The only way they could have done it was by eating fats. But you have to ask, these, these hominids could not hunt down anything, not even a deer or anything. They were scared. How did they get the fat into their diets suddenly to evolve into what we call now the homo sapiens? Well, they did it by sucking on marrow bones of kills that were made by bigger carnivores or by sucking out the contents of the brain pan. By, they essentially were, were looking at other kills and were behaving much like a hyena would. But at the end of the day, that encephalized them and you exist because there was increased animal fat in the diet of the hominids. We probably wouldn't, wouldn't have you where you are now if somebody in the many, many, many years ago did not eat animal fats. So I'm giving you both sides of it, all right? Now we are well evolved. I'm not sure we need to eat more fats to grow bigger brains, but we owe a lot to the fats that were eaten earlier. I don't know how we are evolving, to be honest. So that's why I liked your question. I do think it, it calls on us to introspect and be philosophical about what we eat because we surely are evolving even now in our intelligence and how that will evolve, how does that depend on food? And, and honestly, if you don't eat a little of everything, I just feel you're just lowering your chances because you're going into something that's very odd. So I hope I've answered your question. I went off track a little just because it was you who was asking, but otherwise I think plant foods, I'm all for it. I don't know if you know that they're making burgers out of plant material these days, and it apparently tastes very good. Yeah, and they're also growing meat now in labs, so that's a new yeah, that uh, thing, which is which is not plant based, but uh, yeah, that'll have B twelve most probably. Right. So you're okay with that. Yeah. Thanks a lot. That was a really helpful answer. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Dr. Cooper. I'll just add to that, uh, Shiva Kumar uh, has a similar question which you touched upon. Uh, what about B12 for vegetarians? Should they take compulsory supplements? This is the question. Yes, yes, yes. I cannot say that more times. There is no way out for a vegan, not vegetarian. A vegetarian, as we define it, is someone who drinks milk or, and if that milk, if you can manage about half a liter per day in different forms, including curds, some in your tea, some, you know, as plain milk or lassi, whatever you want, that will meet all your requirements. But if you're a vegan, for heaven's sake, please do it. And if you put your child onto that diet, I would say it's criminal if you don't give a B12 supplement because you certainly are are, are reducing the, the growth of that child. Thank you, Dr. Kopak. I'll move on to the question by AP Radhakrishna. He's asking, I'm a pure vegetarian. Oh, just a moment. Uh, yeah. I think you finished that question. Yeah, I'm a, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, I missed the page actually. I'm a pure vegetarian. Amino acids are essential for reduction of cholesterol and healthy heart. Fish is very good one. Hence, I used to take cod liver tablets. Any other plant-based supplement, I think, uh, uh, one can replace this with. Okay, so I want to be very clear to you that the cod liver oil capsule is an oil capsule. It's meant to give you what are called omega-3 fats, which are very, very important in the diet. Omega-3 is what keeps you alive. Omega-6 tends to push you towards death. So, and unfortunately for us, all our oil sources are omega-6. When you go out and buy that heart-healthy oil, remember, again, it's, it's just the pendulum swinging too much. It's all omega-6, sunflower oil and all those things. What you really want is to take oil in a reasonable amount, not too much oil. Don't fry your food. Why would you want to do that? But just if you take the mustard oil, and groundnut oil and sesame oil, the three oils that India has always survived on, they're the best. All these new ones that came in palm oil and all this heart healthy stuff, I really feel they're, they're so heavy on omega-6 that that causes inflammation in you. So while it may reduce your cholesterol, it may not be very good for your other things and heart inflammations. So to balance that, people began to start taking omega-3. Omega-3 is found to some extent in sesame oil, but the best of flax seeds, but it is found in fish oils. So the cod liver oil you took is a good thing. But remember, I told you this, omega-3 oils get oxidized. So please increase your intake of fruits when you're taking that tablet. Um, so yeah, your cod liver oil is a good one. Amino acids do not reduce your cholesterol. I want to say that very clearly. The reason your cholesterol is high or low is because of genetics. It's your liver, it'll produce. You can stop eating cholesterol. You will still increase your, uh, your, your cholesterol because you synthesize, you will make it in your liver. You have to stop that process and people now use statins for that. But otherwise, you know, omega-3, you're, what you're saying is right. Amino acids are very good for, for you. You require them to keep your muscle mass up. So please keep eating good quality protein like dal protein or milk protein or egg protein or meat protein. All of them are good quality, but rice and wheat protein are not great. And now I'm happy that everyone's against gluten. Gluten is the protein in wheat. And that's great. If you don't like gluten, go and eat some dal. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kruppel. Uh, Professor Pranav uh, uh, has a question uh, or a comment, maybe. Professor Pranav, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask uh, about India's you know, future protein security. Does it lie, in your opinion, in um, uh, millets? Because you mentioned millets at some point. Uh, is that you know, the most uh, practical way forward? Yeah, uh, again, the quality of protein in millets isn't great. Millets and cereals are lysine limited. What you really need for protein security, so put it this way, if I were to ask you, eat only millets to get your protein requirements, you'll have to eat a lot more because the lysine is limited. So if you eat a 
bit more of millets you in spite of that limiting nature you will deliver enough lysine in total into the body so that's not great because then you're also getting a lot of energy and you'll just push towards obesity there's a theory that man eats to satisfy his lysine needs and if he's doing that and he's eating cereals he'd eat too much of those cereals so for protein security it has to be pulses okay. it is such a pity that pulses cost 100 rupees per kilo in this country and we are importing yellow pea from canada and from australia and the landed price in a port in india for yellow pea is 20 rupees a kilo now yellow pea looks just like chana it's one fifth the cost the reason they can produce it at that level is because they do mega farming and in india we're all fragmented in our farming it's impossible to reduce the costs the fixed costs of farming. And as a result, we, we just have very expensive uh, dal in this country. I wish we could find a way to reduce that. Even Myanmar, countries around us produce dal with much greater efficiency than us. We produce approximately half a ton per hectare of dal. That's terribly low. No, that's why a farmer won't even grow it. They, they just uh, throw up their hands and say, let's do cereals. Because if I grow cereals, then the government will come and buy it from me. Sorry, I went on too long. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kupat. I will uh, quickly go through the questions. There are quite a few, and we will uh, run short of time. So uh, next question is by Anchal, and she's asking, um, Sir, with PCOD on the rise in women of reproductive age group, can you enlighten us with can you enlighten us which kind of food composition or diet should be prescribed? Oh, you know, with PCOD, they do put on a lot of weight and they really need to look at weight management through exercise and, and diet. Um, the treatment is hormonal, but eventually the obesity can only be treated through diet. And you need to find a good dietitian who can work with you and you need to increase your physical activity. And uh, there are plenty of gyms today that help you to do this. One thing I really, that's why I said gym, is gyms are not places where you become a muscle-bound person today. They do a lot of what they call uh, endurance and other exercises and, and mixed training, which basically is very important. But here's the thing, you can injure yourself if you do it on your own. You can injure a knee. And once you injure your knee, it'll be even worse because your physical activity goes down to zero. So please try and increase your physical activity, reduce your intake. Otherwise, it is a hard one to crack. There is no easy answer. Thank you, Dr. Kurbat. Uh, I'll move to the next question by uh, Shruti Pai. Uh, what is your view on prebiotics, probiotics, and symbiotics as supplements for good health? Uh, it's a pleasure hearing Shruti. Um, uh, yeah, I think she asks a very important question. You know, now what's happened is we have understood that there's a massive, massive colony of bacteria residing in our bodies, most of which are in the colon, but there are bacteria in your skin, on bits on your mouth, bits in everywhere, really, but masses, quantities in your colon. And there they produce certain molecules which may help children grow better. That's some work that's coming out of Bangladesh. Uh, it may help uh, prevent cancer of the colon. So there are all these little molecules and they're called postbiotics. They're produced by the, by the probiotics. And those bacteria eventually need something to eat because if you don't feed those bacteria, they begin to graze on the mucus that is produced in the intestine, which is not a very good thing because that, that reduces the mucus barrier. So what we eat to feed them is fiber. I, I think you've heard of diet. I know Shruti knows everything about fiber, but for the rest, dietary fiber is, is a carbohydrate that you can't digest by your pancreas or by your own intestine enzymes. They have to go, they are undigested. They reach the colon where the bacteria fall upon them with great glee because it's a beautiful food for them. And then they, they produce stuff which is good for you. So yes, I do think 
Fiber is a very important part of our diets. We hardly eat enough fiber. And the more refined foods you eat, the worse off you are. You need that fiber. So please, again, ask your dietitian. You need 30 grams of fiber per day. If you can't get it, you're not doing your bacteria a favor. And when you're not doing them a favor, they're going to start chewing on you. So, Shruti, I hope that answers your question. That's, by the way, that, that fiber is called a prebiotic. So when she asked prebiotic, probiotic, prebiotic is the food, probiotic is the bacteria. If you put both of them together in a product, they're called symbiotics. So yeah, I, I don't think we need symbiotics. Take some curds, take some fiber. You should do pretty good. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Thank you for the explanation of prebiotic. I, I was I also wanted to know that. So uh, I'll move on to the next question by Smruti CS. Uh, what is your take on adding sugar to citrus juices in terms of glucose and vitamin C? compete for the same receptor? Uh, that's the question. No. Um, the glucose transporter in the intestine is linked to sodium. And salt and glucose are get absorbed together. That's why when you, you, I don't know if you've heard of something called oral rehydration solution, ORS, which you give to people with diarrhea. They have both salt and sugar in them because the transporter for glucose requires sodium. Vitamin C does not, uh, as, does not compete with glucose. It might, in fact, even get co-transported with glucose. So there's like friends, they'll go together. What's vitamin C really important for in that juice? It's important. One, it'll get absorbed and it's an antioxidant. So it stops you from oxidizing your body, which is a bad thing. And it helps you absorb that iron. Remember, we talked about iron. So that's great. Adding sugar by itself, now let me tell you, um, we're not sure, it's not a good thing, all right? For sure, the more sugar you eat, the more chance you have of getting caries and dental problems and so on. It can also make you more uh, prone to obesity. So pure sugar is not a good thing. When you treat your body to pure sweets, you'll find many people in the popular literature always say, I got a buzz when I ate some sweets. Pure sugar has that, it gets into you and it stimulates your, what we call the autonomic or the sympathetic nervous system. So suddenly your whole body is on a heightened kind of plane of preparedness. That's why people call it a buzz. It's not a good thing to do because your blood pressure goes up and other things go up. You need to keep calm. And so you lose that calm with sugar. So I would say, don't add sugar, why, why would you? And the WHO now says, please don't add more than about 10% of your total calories as sugar. Let me do some sums for you. You recall I told you the total energy intake required was about 1,600 calories. 10% of that is 160 calories. 160 calories translates into 40 grams of sugar. 40 grams of sugar translates into eight tables, eight spoons of sugar, five grams each. So you don't want to eat more than that certainly in a day. I hope that's reasonable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kapoor. Uh, we have one follow-up question from the probiotic discussion. Um, this question is from Juni. He's asking, do bacteria in probiotic, do the bacteria in probiotic reach the intestine alive? This is the first part. And second part is, as in, I have also heard that they get killed in the stomach. So the regulations around probiotics is that they have to be acid resistant because the stomach secretes acid and they have to be bile, bile salt resistant because once you get past the stomach, you go through another uh, thing of stress, which is the bacteria attacked by bile salts and that can kill. So if you want to get that label of probiotics in India, you have to demonstrate that your bacteria are resistant to acid and resistant to bile salts. Once they get past this uh, barrier of acid and bile salts, then they can pass into the intestine without any trouble at all. So that's why makers of probiotics say, we are, we are special because we are so resistant to those things. Whereas if you take the bacteria and curds, maybe they're not that resistant. Was there a second question? Um, yeah, I think you addressed both the questions, yes. 
so if it's a, they are resistant then they won't be uh, they won't get killed they won't get yeah they'll make it yes uh, okay so i'll move on to the next question uh, kiran mehta is asking do you recommend intermittent fasting i knew someone would ask me that thank you for that um, so here's the thing i'll be honest uh, my wife and my son and my son do it okay much to my uh, dismay because i personally said well you know just eat less i mean everyone's looking for a solution saying i want to eat a lot of food i want to lose weight but i want some special way to do it eat less as simple as that so i have to tell you my son's lost weight on it my wife not that much i think she cheats actually so maybe that's why it doesn't work but i i wouldn't do it so straight away in my family i'll tell you there's a 50% success rate there so i wish i could answer your question there have been studies that have shown it works there are studies that show it doesn't work there are studies now that are looking at ramzan to say the ramzan fasting is an ideal way to see if people lose weight hello they don't people actually come off ramzan putting on weight because they feast too much in that time so i would say the simple thing is just eat less yeah if you want to fast for a longer period i have no problem with it 16 hours fasting in a day what's not to like about it if you're hungry and you're embracing it what's not to like about it as long as you're not feeling faint and you don't think that you're you're sweating and you're suddenly going to fall over you're you're functional what's not to like about it go for it thank you thank you dr kopat um i i do ha- i was waiting for that question i have to say <laughs> okay glad i attended to that question so uh, the next question is by uh, krishna and he says uh, thanks a lot for the wonderful talk i would like to know if there are some diet recommendation for type 1 diabetes the way carbohydrates absorbed by the body that will help to manage the insulin doses really good question um so type 1 unfortunately uh it's it's nothing to do with insulin resistance or fatness in the body or weight loss your pancreas isn't producing the insulin that you require so what happens in in many of them is they can have very low weight um and one needs to be sure that they're eating correct because every time they take insulin they have to make sure that they eat correctly now the absorption of glucose there's nothing wrong with that you will absorb glucose if you've got if there's salt as well in the food that's why you don't want to eat pure glucose you don't want to eat pure salt mixing it up makes makes sense uh beyond that you just have to make sure that you are meeting your requirements you're eating balanced and you're eating diets that don't have too much of refined sugar but have sugars that need to be digested and slowly release it so that you don't go into acute bouts of what we call hypoglycemia because of the insulin you're taking um but otherwise it's it's more an action of just balancing out that insulin and your glucose i i can imagine that you are asking this because of the risk of suddenly getting lightheaded because the insulin is too much in comparison to the glucose it is a problem with anyone who's taking insulin and it's just a question of balancing it in a way that ensures that there's a steady flow of glucose into the body if you watch tennis players playing and you see what they eat during the break a lot of them will will, <clears throat> will have a sandwich or some banana all these are basically complex carbohydrates which break down slowly now you don't have to eat the whole sandwich eat just a small part of it but it keeps you going that's all the advice i can give you over this line because one doesn't want to keep going too much on this thank you dr kupat so on a lighter note we have a interesting question by siddharth s uh, he is asking um, why do we not stop feeling hungry even after one masala dosa if it is supposed to be enough <laughs> okay let me let me tell you this okay <clears throat> why do you actually feel hungry and why do you feel full the the reason is that actually your stomach is this little organ that constricts okay and the more you put into it the more it expands so think of your stomach like a balloon and if you stuff it with a lot of food and a lot of volume that remember that 1 kilo i told you about you make it you stretch its skin the uh, its wall 
Now, when you have a stomach that has a stretched wall, it releases a hormone called ghrelin. I don't know if you've heard of this, but look it up. It's spelled G-H-R-E-L-I-N. Ghrelin is the hormone that makes you feel hungry. So if you, for example, ate your one kilo meal and you're used to it, and then you don't eat for some time, remember you've got your stomach that's stretched out. It's now flapping in the breeze in your, in your abdominal cavity, but it's stretched. It's going to release a lot of ghrelin and you're going to feel a lot hungry. You'll find, therefore, that people who, for whatever reason, maybe it's an impoverished student who doesn't have money and is eating less, you'll find that that student over time gets used to it. They start eating less and less and they feel okay with it. And then when you take that poor student out saying, let me feed you and you know, give you a slap up meal. If you feed that student too much, he'll probably throw up because the stomach isn't used to that much food. So remember your stomach is an adaptive organ. It's telling your brain, I want more. And if you keep it all stretched out all the time, with your two masala dosas, if you had them, <laughs> well, two, one masala dosa isn't going to help. But if you took somebody who always ate half a masala dosa, they will feel good with it. Please don't eat more than one masala dosa, I have to tell you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kupat. Uh, Professor Ajit, uh, you're there. Uh, you had a question. Yeah, yeah, I had typed type it already. So uh, I had a question about this um, nutrition depletion of plants with the climate yes. change. Yes. How is this happening? Is it because of the increase in the temperature? Is in the, no, the carbon dioxide. <clears throat> so what carbon they've dioxide. done is they've done these experiments where they increase the carbon dioxide to 50 parts per million uh, to 500 parts per million. So 50 is what it is now. And they went up to, I think, 500 or 400. And these were very well done experiments in, in these kind of poly houses. And they actually found that it reduced a lot of things. So one, so there, you know, there are two types of plants, what are called C3 and C4 plants. One of which is very much, uh, uh, well, I'm not an agricultural scientist and my agriculture friends keep explaining this to me. The C3 plants are the older plants, like the millets. And those millets and the older plants are much more resistant to changes in temperature and carbon dioxide. The C4 plants, which are the more modern plants, which are grown by man as he became a pastoralist, are the ones that are, they, they grow faster. So you can grow three crops in a year without any trouble. But they are much more sensitive to these problems. Uh, it has something to do with the, with, the, uh, with the biosynthesis of glucose within the plant leaf material. I do not know enough about that. But it's, it's, it's being shown over and over again and it really is a serious source of worry to the extent that we have asked for funding from the Indian government to check this out. And you know that there are many genotypes of plants. We're actually with the UAS people looking for the right genotypes that are resistant to this and whose protein content has not been affected. So thank you for that question, but maybe in five years we'll have an answer for you as to whether we have res uh, these uh, resistant phenotypes in our farming. I see. I had a different question as well. Um, so, so you mentioned about this article by Amartya Sen. So I even, I'm trying to understand what is the take home message? Because uh, you, know, this, you mentioned that there's those, the, the people in, for example, Bihar self-reported that they are sort of more healthy and less um, you know, ill, et cetera. But there is an extra uh, factor there, right? Which is the access to the healthcare. Yeah. Very good. Uh, so if you don't have access to healthcare, you might, you know, don't worry about it. So what, what exactly is the, the telling? Oh, Amartya actually said in his article that there are dangers of self-reporting and making too much out of it. So he wrote it as a sort of a viewpoint article. You're absolutely right. There are many confounders here. But I would just say this, that and this happens, you know, when you look at things. Uh, if you go and go into some very rural areas where people are not educated enough, many times if a child is having diarrhea, and this is a mild diarrhea, the mother kind of feels that's normal. And that's, my, my earlier children also had it. Does that tell you something? That essentially there is a, 
there is an acceptance, a stoicness, which I may call it, which actually makes them feel that, yeah, why are you complaining about this? It's normal. So I agree with you that self-reports are very confounded, but I have actually seen places where the child has actually defecated inside the house. And there's not a huge big deal about it. I'm sure in your house, if somebody defecated right in the, in the main room, you'd probably qu get quite upset about it. Um, I'm not saying one of you is right or wrong. I'm just saying it comes to that stoicness and that experience of what happened before. I think you're asking a very deep question here. And I wish I had time to sit with you and discuss it. But I'll stop there only in the interest of time. OK, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. So there are a few more questions. Uh, should I continue? Uh, do you have time or as, as you suggest, Dr. Krupp? I've got nothing on my calendar. OK, great, great. So uh, uh, Professor Pranav, you also have a question. I, it seems if you please go ahead. I'll meanwhile uh, select a few questions. Yeah, I wanted to ask about uh, you know precision or personalized nutrition. Um, you know, what are some of the techniques uh, you know, used there? And also, what is, how do you see the subject evolving over the coming decades? Yes. With things like gene sequencing becoming yes. sort of uh, cheaper, is it feasible that in the future we might be able to make very personalized recommendations of uh, nutritional recommendations very at good. low cost? Um, ah, now you put, the, you put the kicker there, low cost. Well, you could actually be on the NIH panel the US NIH has actually put a few hundred million dollars into the pursuit of precision nutrition. And that hundred million is because of the complex and multi-omic approach. They call it the exposome that they want to measure. That is, they'll measure uh, pollution. They'll measure everything in the environment. They'll measure the food. They'll measure all the exposures. Then they will look at uh, non-modifiable factors like the genes. They will look at modifiable genetics like epigenetics, and then they will look at proteome, the metabolome, everything, and the microbiome, which is the colonic bacteria. They're going to do it all, but I'll tell you what we're doing for the time being, and that is that we have focused on measuring function really well. So if you come to our clinic, what we are doing is to measure uh, well, it's, it's like things around muscle function, to measure things around mental function, to measure things around gut function, um, and there are others that are... So every function we can think of is being measured, which is not normally done. We're also measuring the microbiome. We're measuring genetics. So we're looking at nutri-genetics, which is how does it link up? Because certainly, if you look at the man who... Do you know that... There's this person called Craig Venter. I don't know if you've heard of him, but Craig Venter was a person who worked with the NIH to do the first human genome. I don't know, you must have heard of the Human Genome Project, that enormous big science project. Craig Venter actually was a private individual who helped. But when the human genome was published, everyone suspected that the genome that was measured or that came out was actually Craig Venter's. And later in a BBC talk, he was asked, now that you know your genome, what do you know about yourself? And he actually at the time said, I know very little about myself. All I know is that I can, I can drink a lot of coffee because I've got the genes to actually uh, to, to detoxify coffee in my liver. So I can take six cups of coffee a day. He stopped there. So we are doing a little more of that kind of thing, which is the sort of nutrigenetics, which tells you about how you can actually uh, engage with the types of foods that you eat. But more on that later, because we're just setting this up because we've got different labs and we're now bringing them all into one, <clears throat> one uh, roof in St. John's, which is the Precision Nutrition Group, which will actually work with people. And we have also are looking at psychiatrists and psychologists because people eat because they're stressed. People eat because they're unhappy or happy. The question is, how do you manage that? And we're also looking at physiotherapists to help you to to. So there's a lot going on, and uh, you're very welcome to come and visit us and get a free. Oh, I can't, I can't give you the lab test free, but all the rest free. You'll get my time free for sure, and uh, we can help you out. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Kruk. But actually, this segues uh, nicely to a question by, um, yeah, oh, I think I missed the question. Yeah, yeah. So this is a question by uh, Swanan uh, Kanpurkar, and she's asking uh, a follow-up on probiotic, prebiotic. Uh, how should one go about finding if one's gut microbiota is appropriate for one's well-being? Would you recommend a personal microbiome diagnosis or are there any generalized protocols for Indian populations? Very good question. <clears throat> so you just heard a question from Shruti Pai earlier. Now what she's chasing is, is there a gut microbiota that is specifically good for children to grow with? So what she's looking at is a bunch of children and actually figuring out who grew better and linking that to the food intake and the microbiota. And uh, at some point, if you come to St. John's, you can talk to her. But what they're doing definitely at, uh, in Bangladesh is to actually create foods that seem to make, ch that might make children grow better in terms of their microbiota. Um, and they think that the key microbiome uh, members that are important there are lactobacilli and bifidobacteria. In fact, you'll notice that almost all the trials of microbiota or probiotics in health have been either lactobacilli or bifidobacteria, but there, there could be more. So I think you've asked such a deep question, it's so important. And I think that that's what everyone's chasing as a, a holy grail almost. All we can right now do is, you have something like Yakult, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a microbiota product, a probiotic that's available in the market. It's a single bacteria. It's lactobacillus uh, something shirota. <clears throat> and that by itself has shown some good effects. They've done the trials. Bifidobacteria work well, they've done the trials. Mixtures of both are doing well, but we really need that full microbiome signature that you're after. This is very big science, I have to tell you. It requires enormous uh, informatics and computing power. It requires money. But I think at the end of the day, we're going to get there because the Indian government is funding it. There are right now, I don't know if you're a scientist with a lab, but if you were, you could respond to the Indian government who has made calls for exactly this, saying they want to see projects in this area. So both you and Dr. Pandit are very prescient because you know exactly where the big money is. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Krupa. So there is a, a common question um, which has been asked by a few of our uh, attendees. Uh, Rukmini also has the same question. What is your opinion on salt and spices and chili intake in Indian diet? Is it healthy? Well, <clears throat> you know, there was a time when I used to, before COVID, when I used to go for conferences abroad and sit at lunch with a lot of people and found a, a plate of chilies on the table. In the, in the US, at least, there was this feeling that chilies helped you lose weight. <laughs> so it's all back to you're sweating it out and so on. Well, I, I, I'm just saying that as a joke. But I love chilies and I'll eat any amount of them. Yeah, I do suffer. I have uh, bad gastritis after that. But so is it healthy? No, I haven't really lost weight with it. Uh, do I feel good about it? Yeah, sure. When I eat chili and particularly for breakfast, and here's the point that many cultures do not eat chilies for breakfast. We do. You go, again, travel abroad, and you'll find that their breakfast is all sweet stuff. And I feel sleepy all day after that. Maybe it's jet lag, but you know what I mean. So yeah, I, I like chilies. I think it's good. The salt is a problem. Salt is seriously a problem in India. I'm sure you know that. That the WHO and many other places, the average, okay, I'm going with that, is said to be about the requirement should be around five grams a day. In India, it's more than 10. We're eating more than 10. It is an enormous amount. And if you think about public health, one of the most serious things in public health, diabetes has hogged all the limelight. You know what should hog the limelight? It's blood pressure. One in two, or sorry, one in three or four adults have high blood pressure yet it doesn't come into the newspapers. But if 15% of people have diabetes, it's a big deal. Actually, both of them are a problem, but one is like the, the film star and the other one is the pauper 
and no one's giving it any attention. We should be reducing the salt. It is a terrible thing that we are doing by ignoring the salt and going after the sugar. So thank you for asking that question. In terms of the spices, I think all spices, I don't know enough about it, but I have a student who's actually using cinnamon and a couple of other spices to see whether she can bump up fat oxidation in the night, because that's when you oxidize fat, when you're fasting through the night. And she has the suspicion that cinnamon and the, the chemical inside cinnamon does something to increase fat oxidation. Well, that's another story. But I, did, I mean, spices, again, in the correct amounts, nothing wrong with it. It's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kupat. Uh, I'll uh, club two questions together by uh, um, Gowda and uh, Prabhavati. The question is, we keep forcing child to eat more, especially morning, we force a child to eat more. Is it right? And the second part is, we keep forcing a child to eat more because she's thin. Is it right? So, yeah. Very good. Very good. I want to tell you this. This is a fun fact that you should know. And all parents should know this, that typically a child will reach its half its adult height. Stay with me here. It'll reach half its adult height by the end of two years, say two and a half years. After that, the growth percentile, I mean, children grow along a path. They canalize into that path and they stay there. It's very hard to shift them in height. The first two years, they shift around a lot and they stabilize into that half adult height by two years. So if a child is three feet tall at the end of two years, it's probably gonna be a six footer. Now here's the thing. Many parents think that a thin child is not correct and so on. That's wrong. I think you have to go with height because the length is important. Now, of course, if both parents are short, then the reason a child is short is not nutrition, it's genetics. But if both parents were reasonably of a reasonable height and the child is, is, is not doing well, then certainly you need to worry. But if you're waited till after two years, you're likely by overfeeding that child to push them to become, to grow sideways, not this way. And by that, I mean, you can have a child that becomes obese. Remember this, obesity tracks into adulthood. It's really hard to, once the child is that obese track, to get them off it. It takes great willpower from the child, not from the parents, to actually eat less. And that happens sometimes in adolescence when they want to impress girls or girls want to impress boys, then they want to worry about their figure and then they get into all these crazy things. But until then, please don't overfeed children just because you think they're thin. Ask yourself the simple question, is their height okay? Are they doing well in school? Are they? Is your teacher saying they're okay? Are they, are they falling asleep in school? That's a good reason. Are they sleeping well at home? Are they doing well in, uh, in their homework? Are they playing with other kids? Chase normality. That thinness is nothing. It, it, it doesn't matter at all. The whole business of pushing food, particularly in that first two years, I don't know if you've ever fed children, I have, and it's, it's enormously difficult. You'll find mothers will be chasing a toddler around the house with a spoonful of food and hoping to shove it into their mouth. That's the problem, that children are very distracted at that time. It's hard to feed them. And that's why the fat content of the diet is higher in the first two years. It tends to be almost 40% fat. And many mothers forget that. They think fat's bad. It's not. Fat's good because fat is energy dense. So one teaspoonful of fat contains far more energy, double or more than one teaspoon of carbohydrate. So it's good if you can mix this up. Don't overfeed a child. They know how much they need to eat. And if they are active and they are running away and you can't catch them, think about it. It's you who are fat, not the child. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kruppert. That was an uh, amazing uh, answer. So uh, this is the second last question uh, from Ambali. And she is asking, what are your thoughts on food labeled organic? Ah. <laughs> Let me tell you, organic foods are just more expensive in my opinion. There's actually nothing. It's, I mean, it's a great thing for a farmer to make money from people who are urban and rich. Um, I have read reports from the National Institute of Nutrition that tell me 
that the pesticide content on fruits and veg in India is not very high, all right? It's not very high. Although there are reports from some places that there's a lot of pesticide, what NIN has found has been, it's not a lot. Now, if you wash your fruits and veg, you should get rid of them, okay? And honestly, to me, that's what's something that I would do rather than chase after organic, but I will do one thing. You know, it's a rule of thumb for me. When I go shopping, not here so much in this country as outside, if you find a rack of vegetables that are beautiful to look at, they're probably odd things, they're oddities. Vegetables should look misshapen and ugly because that's the variability in their growth. When you see non-variable vegetables, you know there's some, mis some sort of jugglery going on there, something genetic, something else. But when you see capsicums that look uniform, you've got to ask yourself, is there something wrong there? Because if you were to grow capsicums, you'll find you get different shapes. So here's my thing. Don't chase organic. Chase those ugly vegetables, the ones you don't want a pretty looking capsicum. It doesn't matter if it looks a little gnarly and so on. And secondly, wash it well. Organic, well, if you're an, you know, I do a little bit of amateur farming. I'll tell you, I've often toyed with the idea of going out. I, I am organic, by the way, but I've toyed with the idea of actually trying to create a business where I sell, I grow chilies, for example, organic chilies. I keep thinking, you know, I don't want to con people. The truth is there's nothing. I mean, you know, there's nothing organic about it. It's just there. And you want to pay double, go ahead and pay. But don't go for those pretty looking vegetables. There's something wrong with it. Go for the variable looking vegetables. That's my advice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kupat. So at last I get to ask you a question. So, uh, uh, so my question to you, Dr. Kupat is uh, what, what is your, uh, take on this vitamin D supplements, which have been uh, touted by many that uh, uh, helps against uh, respiratory disorders. And uh, also people are deficient in vitamin D due to the uh, uh, current lifestyle. What is Very your- good. Very good. I was waiting for that as well. And COVID has made us all very vitamin D uh, aware. There's no doubt if you're vitamin D deficient, you certainly need it. But don't take too much, as I, I said about supplements and nutrient supplements, when you're normal, taking more doesn't make it a superfood. So it's not going to make you more immune to COVID. No. If, you, it, if you're vitamin D deficient, you may have been less immune. You'll just come to normal and you'll be like the other arm admi who is sitting in the sun and getting all his vitamin D. So the problem is that vitamin D deficiency is being overdiagnosed in this country, in my opinion. It's come to the point where, as a doctor, if somebody comes to me with vague symptoms and I send his blood away for vitamin D. It's a great relief for me if I can't figure out what's wrong. I know vitamin D will come deficient. And then I say, aha, I figured out what's wrong with you. Go and take this. And then that guy's off my back for some time. So you see where I'm getting with this, that vitamin D is a funny little uh, chemical. You can make it in your body if you've got enough sunshine. According to the National Institute of Nutrition, you can get vitamin D, it's called D2, which, is, which comes from uh, cereals and millets. So you can get quite a lot from there, but that's only the N9 that's saying it. Uh, but D3 is the non-veg type uh, vitamin D. I hope you know, for those of you who are hardcore vegetarians, that if you buy vitamin D, it comes from sheep wool. So it's non-veg. So if you really want vitamin D that's veg, you have to go for what's called D2. And that is a separate product. It's also as effective and it's there in your diet because it's vegetarian. The problem is that the cutoff for vitamin D to define deficiency came from studies in which they looked at children who had a condition called rickets. I don't know if you've heard of rickets. It's where your bones become very weak and uh, can break easily. The problem is that you can diagnose rickets due to vitamin D in countries where they drink milk, but they have no sunshine. So if you go to very Northern latitudes, there's a lot of milk in the diet. So they're, they're getting a lot of calcium, 
but there's no sunshine. As a result, they can go vitamin D deficient and become rickety. In India, if you see a child who's got rickets, a child could be rachitic because it has a low calcium intake. Our intakes are not great of calcium. So that's the problem that in India, if you take rickets as your endpoint, you've got both low calcium and low vitamin D fighting with each other to cause that disease. We are not clear as to what the real cutoff is. And until then, we are using the foreign cutoffs, which come from those northern latitudes. I think it's over-diagnosing vitamin D deficiency. So you get papers that say, the whole of India is de deficient. 80% of people are, I'm sure as you're sitting there in front of your computer, out of the sunshine, you're probably vitamin D deficient yourself. And how nice would it be if you came to me saying, you know, I've got these vague aches and pains. And I say, oh, you're vitamin D deficient, go out into the sun. Probably do you some good, but is that really the reason? I don't know. So vitamin D, let me be clear, I've ranted about it for some time now, but I'll tell you this. Yes, it's important for immunity. If you're deficient and truly deficient, if you're not, you're okay. Go out into the sunshine, roughly about half an hour of sunshine with short sleeved shirt. Look at me now, all right? I'm wearing an open collared shirt. I have short sleeves. If I go out into the sunshine for half an hour, around midday, and I do do that, you will make all the vitamin D you need. You don't need to strip off your shirt. All that's not required. But you do need a short sleeve shirt. So I hope you'll at least take that into consideration if you're worried about COVID. Go out into the sun. Sure. sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kupat, for this uh, fantastic talk. And uh, I have not added to, to many of the questions where people have mentioned that the talk was excellent. And it has been a more of a mythbuster talk, I would say. Uh, since uh, Professor Pranav and Rukmini are around, Professor Ajit is around. If any comments from our uh, uh, co-hosts, it's not uh, mythbuster. It's a snake oil, snake oil. Uh, <laughs> talk. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kulpa. That was really uh, very enlightening, and thank you for staying back for so long. And yeah, this discussion was really wonderful. I think that's. Uh, a really important part of the, the talk. So thanks for a wonderful talk and for the discussion. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I love the company of physicists. I have to tell you this. Um, one of the things I do is to actually measure the gamma radiation coming off people. And I relate that to the amount of potassium inside them. And it's a lot of fun because that radiation depends on the geometry of that person. And... Uh, I have hired mathematicians to help me uh, understand that. But physicists are great fun. So I'm always happy to talk to all of you. Thank you very much. That was very informative and very enjoyable. Thank you so much for agreeing. Very welcome.